I think we're ready to start. Um, and we would start our session with a video, I believe. That's always technical issues. Hi, my name is Jesse, and I am your virtual presenter. I would like to welcome you all at this open forum, Accelerating an Inclusive Energy Transition. Thank you all for coming. Luckily, I will not be your real host today. While artificial intelligence offers many opportunities for innovation, nothing beats a real life moderator. Give a warm welcome to Elisa Hever, MAG member and senior policy officer at the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our session. Um, uh, well, I've already been introduced by uh, by AI, but thank you, thanks. Well, I'm really pleased that we don't have an AI moderator because probably everybody's name would be mispronounced um, then because uh, my name is actually Alisa Hever and not Hever. Um, um, yeah, so we will be talking about uh, sustainability this afternoon and AI and the energy transition. Um, today, this morning in the Dutch newspaper, we could read that um, AI might uh, require as much energy as the Dutch uh, economy requires now um, if, if generative AI will, uh, will continue to grow as fast as it's growing now. And I believe it was 2027. Um, but um, I'm not the expert on this topic. Um, we thankfully do have a few experts um, here in the room and, uh, and online as well. Um, first of all, we have Hannah Bauter. Uh, she is from um, uh, the uh, ECP, which is a, a platform um, and, uh, for uh, coalitions uh, in the Netherlands. Um, oh, s I should I also do the slides? <laughs> Oh, okay, perfect. Um, and uh, she will um, give an explanation um, uh, or do an explanation uh, on the guidance of ethics approach and uh, chances of digitalization in the energy transition. And um, uh, she will also uh, do an explanation about Mentimeter because we want to make this session uh, very uh, interactive, as I already said. Um, thereafter, we will have a, a pr brief presentation from Neil York. He is um, from the Dutch, um, uh, from the Technical University in Delft, um, and he's part of the Dutch Coalition on AI. Um, thereafter, we will have Tim, and he is from Tim Vermeulen, um, and he is a um, uh, strategy board member from uh, uh, in at. Uh, Aliander, that is a Dutch network, uh, energy network operator. Um, and uh, he's part of the Dutch National Coalition uh, for Sustainable Digitalization. And uh, last but definitely not least, um, we have uh, Chan Tara Peach. Uh, Yes, um, and uh, she is uh, from the organizing committee of the Youth Internet Governance Forum in Cambodia. Um, so now we've done the introductions and we'll go over to uh, Hannah. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alisa, and thank you all uh, here today in Kyoto and a lot online for attending this session. Uh, my name is Hannah, I'm working for ACP, Platform for the Information Society, where we organize public-private cooperation. I'm involved in two of those uh, public-private uh, cooperation projects. Um, the first is the Dutch uh, National Coalition for Sustainable Digitization, where I'm uh, the secretary, and I'm also involved at the guidance ethics approach, uh, where I'm moderator. So both projects will contribute to this session today on accelerating an inclusive energy transition. So first, I will briefly tell you a bit more about the Coalition for Sustainable Digitization, and then I'll tell you how we will explore the ethical dimensions of the energy transition uh, with the help of the guidance ethics approach. Oh. 
So uh, the Dutch and um, National Coalition for Sustainable Digitization is a coalition where we work with stakeholders from the quadruple helix, meaning the government, uh, business industries and SMEs, uh, civil society and universities on the greening of IT, but we also look on greening by IT. Um, and in this session, we will actually dive into both <laughs> because we will look at uh, how we can accelerate the energy transition with artificial intelligence. But like uh, Alicia, Alisa also uh, just mentioned, it's also very important to look at how we can incorporate sustainability into the design of AI. I'm getting confused with the arrows. <laughs> so, um, um, as with every technology, um, uh, ethics are in play. So it's important to explore the ethical uh, dimensions. And to do that, we need your participation today. So I'm going to explore or explain how we're going to do that. So throughout the presentations, we ask you to listen carefully and identify implicit and also explicit, the explicit values that are mentioned. Um, I will help you a little bit with how you can identify implicit values with help of the guidance ethics approach, which I will explain briefly in a minute. Um, and then uh, after my contribution, uh, Doreen will help you to log in into Mentimeter, so keep your phones ready for that. Um, and then the values we identify together will be input for the panel discussion, uh, so we can see how we can sustain them in the European, but also in the Asian uh, perspective on the energy transition. So guidance ethics approach, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> so this is uh, an ethical method uh, that actually looks at the effects of a technology in a very specific context. So it's not high over, but it looks at that specific context. Those effects can be positive, they can be negative, and they are identified together with the people and organizations involved with the application of a technology in that specific context. So behind effects, you can find values. And I'm going to show you an example in a second to make that more concrete. Um, and if we've identified values that are relevant in a specific context, we can actually use them as a starting point to design the technology, to implement the technology in the specific environment we're talking about, but also in how we use the technology in that environment as a human being. I think I'm missing some slides, actually. <laughs> well, that's okay. I can explain it. I just let me see. Yeah. Okay. Can you can you get my slides? <laughs> All right. I'm just gonna. Um, um, talk you through it. I think that's going to be fine. Uh, so the uh, guidance ethics approach was developed uh, from out ACP with the Technical University of Twente, several stakeholders from government, civil society and business uh, um, industry. Um, so the uh, approach always starts with a technology in a specific context. So today the technology is artificial intelligence in the context of uh, the European energy transition and the context of the Asian energy transition. So um, certain effects can be found in that and you will hear those effects mentioned uh, by the speakers telling you about the transitions today. Um, uh, and we can use those values to uh, actually design the technology in such a way that we sustain those values. Oh, there we are. <laughs> so the first uh, stage, technology in context, we ask you to participate to identify the values, and then our panel will use the values to uh, look at how we sustain them in the technology, the environment, and as how we use the technology. So I'm going to give you a quick example. So, for instance, um, hypothetically speaking, if we apply AI on the energy grid to match supply and demand, and there is not enough supply to fulfill all demand, choices have to be made. So, AI doesn't uh, prioritize in the sense of what is uh, needed, for example, for health. So a negative effect might be that a crucial asset, for example a hospital, is left without power. 
So behind that effect, we're actually talking about the value of social responsibility. So then the question in stage three of this method is how we can design a technology, and the implementation of the technology and the use of it to sustain this value. I hope that's clear for everyone now. So short recap, grab your phone, <laughs> log into Mentimeter, listen carefully to the upcoming speakers if you hear values and answer them into Mentimeter. So at the end of the contributions of the other speakers, we will have a look at those values you entered and then we'll ask them uh, yeah, how they are planning or already sustaining the values mentioned by you. Thank you so much. If, if you can't scan the QR code, then you can also go to menti.com and use the code, oh, uh, use the code, the code, go back to the slide. <laughs> yes, um, and you can use the code for uh, four five seven three two four five one so the question for you is not to think of values already but to listen if you hear values mentioned by our speakers and as I explained, sometimes you can find values behind certain effects, like I just uh, gave the example. Huh? An effect might, might be that an AI is not able to prioritize an asset in the way we as a human would do that. So that means that the value of social responsibility can be found uh, behind that effect. But feel, don't worry if you can't identify that. Just concrete values are great as well. Does it answer your question? Cool. Okay. I yes. Okay. So the code uh, so you ha you can go to menti.com and the code is 45732451. You're welcome. Um I hope we're ready to go to our first presentation or well yeah real presentation from Neil York. Um, is he with us? Yeah. Yes. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. Uh, well, no, we. I don't see you. I do see your slides, though, but it would lo be lovely to see your face as well. Uh, I can hear you and see you, and I'm broadcasting my video. Ah, yes. Now we see you. Oh, perfect. All right. Let me see if I can share this. But now we don't... Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. Now we see both your slides and we will see you when you're talking. Okay, good luck. Okay, talk, talk. Let's see if this works. Well, hello, um, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning from the Netherlands. It's nice to be here and uh, to talk with you. So I'm gonna talk about the inclusive energy transition and the role of AI. So I'll give a few thoughts and a few examples about it. And as was said, I'm from the Delft University of Technology where I sit in the computer science department. Let's see. Great. So I'd like to put out that energy transition is seen, at least in the Netherlands, as the defining challenge of this generation. Um, there's may, perhaps many reasons for this, not least the Netherlands is a low-lying country and feels climate change quite profoundly. And AI is increasingly part of the energy system. It's already there. We're already using AI in, in different ways. And perhaps Tim, when he uh, gives his contribution next, he'll also say more things about this. So I thought it useful to say something about what is AI. AI is perhaps such a broad term and people have different views on it. So uh, here's my one slide on, at least from a computer science perspective, as someone who works in AI, what are we talking about when we say AI and, and then its use in the energy system? So we have two axes here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. At uh, the top is thinking and the bottom is acting. And on the left is humanly and on the right is rationally. So we could, we could do it something like this. You could say, well, AI is, you know, we want to think like humans. We want to have something that's conscious, you might say. Um, that's one view of, of AI, thinking like humans, becoming human-like in that way. Another view is, well, let's not maybe think like humans, but we want to act like humans. 
So to have human level capability um, in many areas, um, so it's somehow I said really strong AI. Other people will say, well, AI, it's about um, being aware of others, the kind of theory of mind. This is more, more philosophical, uh, perhaps more from a philosophical perspective. And the fourth view that people have is it's, well, it's about acting rationally, not acting like a human necessarily, but acting in a way that kind of makes sense. Um, so you might see this is more like the weak AI view. Um, so AI kind of is a tool with excellent abilities in, in certain domains. That, that's what the, the view that I'll be talking about here. So it's not about becoming human-like or even acting necessarily like a human, but acting rationally in a given situation. So this is called the intelligent agent view of AI. And here's a picture, actually some work from TU Delft of the control room of the future. And you see there's, there's no, you know, acting, acting like humans here, but it's AI helping here with grid management. And perhaps, again, I think Tim might say some, some more things about this. So technology and AI, where they're already being used, they're already being used as part of the energy system. Today, I'd like to say they're only part of the solution. AI is not the whole solution to the energy transition. And one reason, at least, is that the societal impacts of an AI energy system will be crucial, but we don't know them yet. We don't know all of the impacts of AI and energy on society. And here's a picture from Unsplash, uh, some residents and perhaps of Amsterdam. And the reason is that the, the ethical, the legal, the, the social, the economic aspects, they need to be studied along with the, the technological aspects. It's not just, okay, we can put this machine learning into this system here. Well, should we do it? If we did it, how does it affect the regulations? Should the regulations change? How does it affect people? How do they feel about it? What are, what's the broad implications, not just the purely technical solution? And here's another nice picture of Amsterdam from Unsplash. So what we'd want to say is that questions like, well, values, we just heard about the, the, uh, the, uh, the ethical guidance approach, things like values, trust, justice, fairness, these questions, these considerations are as important as efficiency, as technical as sustainability and so on. These, you know, these, these non-technical factors. And at least in the view in the Netherlands, we're still emerging our emphasis, our research on these kind of questions as well. But it is there, it is coming. And so a good example is a data center here okay, we can build a large data center. Well, uh, how does it affect the, the people around it? How does that affect our societal priorities? What about the, the, the poor people in the city who don't have enough energy? So on and so forth. So we do see that AI, which are the say as data and algorithms, it can bring benefits. For example, in, in forecasting, demand and supply loads, um, in system design, um, efficiency of the operation of the system, real-time balancing, um, demand response when we have lots of uh, sustainable generation, flexible pricing, we can do markets in new ways. So I do see benefits or potential benefits as we transition away from fossil-based fuels, but at the same time, these non-technical, ethical, legal, social questions, I think are, are worthy of our consideration. And here's a quote from the he uh, head of energy of the World Economic Forum. And I think that the key aspect here is the principles that help us think about how we govern and design and use responsibly AI in the energy system. And let me mention three principles, perhaps. The first is the tr trustworthiness of the technology. So trustworthiness, of course, in many levels, but some aspect is this notion of this meaningful control. This, the, the, the citizens have some say in how their data is used, um, how the system will be designed. Um, the, the, the notion of some kind of um, collaboration between, between the human and the AI. So the whole notion is around trustworthiness. It, it's a large area, of course, in its own. The second value then, this notion of justice and justice in the, in the energy system in particular. So, you know, do I benefit more 
from AI if I have an electric vehicle. But of course, not everybody can afford an electric vehicle. So questions around justice, energy justice in society, um, even in an affluent country like the Netherlands. And the third principle, perhaps this notion of fairness. So, okay, there's a market, there's new types of markets. There's the sellers, there's, there's buyers, there's prosumers of energy. How can we design the market so that's efficient, that's effective, but also that it takes on board notions of fairness? So these are three principles perhaps to think about as we, as we increasingly use AI in the energy system. Now I've mentioned, of course, the Dutch context, and here's a map from Wikipedia, just and only to show you where the Netherlands is, and to say it's this little you know, um, area here. What else is in the European context? And I think here Tim will help us. And of course, what's more broadly in a non-European context? Um, so the question then is, what can the Netherlands learn from other countries? As we talk about AI, as we talk about an inclusive energy transition, and perhaps are there things from the Netherlands which will also be useful in other contexts? Uh, it's an open question perhaps for our discussion later. Perhaps one example of this, um, this is a picture from I think Nigeria, um, and one, one, one area where perhaps the Netherlands can learn is this use of sharing resources together. Um, I just leave that at, on the floor perhaps for, for later discussion. So I've been talking about our inclusive energy transition, the potential of AI, how AI is already being used, and some of the questions perhaps around values and the non-technology side of it. And I'm, I'm curious to, to, to hear what we will discuss together later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Neil, for this informative presentation. I just want to go to the audience. Is there any... Um, quick question that someone wants to ask um, as a follow-up on this uh, on this presentation. If not, then we will directly go to Tim Vermeulen. No? Okay, then we're set to go to Tim. The floor is yours. Tim, we cannot hear you as of now. And now you can? Yes, now we can. Yeah, Lovely. and we can see you. Perfect. Thanks. That's a big bonus. So, hi, everyone. My name is Tim Vermeulen. I've already been introduced, head of digital strategy and architecture for a grid operator in the Netherlands. And I will try to give you an EU perspective on the other energy transition. It's a very broad topic, and I'll try to dive into a few specifics that will help us in a few cases here and dive a bit more into how technology is actually already impacting uh, the landscape uh, so far um, from a European perspective. I just have six slides, but one of the first slides here is um, the energy mix in, Europe, in, uh, the, uh, in the EU, in Europe is changing. Uh, so we see more renewables coming onto the market. I'm saying nothing new here, um, but the energy mix is changing and that is uh, uh, changing re relatively rapidly from a, from a system perspective. So we've done the same thing over uh, decades before, where we have central gener generation of electricity and local use of generation. And basically we're mixing that whole thing up. So from a one-way street, we're changing the entire energy landscape into a two-way street where everyone and every consumer can also be a prosumer. Uh, so you can produce uh, energy and you can use energy. Um, and that's quite uh, impactful. Um, and also leads to a whole new opportunities on jobs, of course, um, so everyone has a more uh, uh, easy way to contribute to energy transition, which is lovely. Um, and also the next speaker is going to talk about how people can e more easily um, uh, um, act uh, in, uh, in the energy transition from this perspective. We see whole new business models popping up. Um, so a whole new part of um, uh, possibilities showing up, but also the question of how do these new markets uh, actually become inclusive and how is technology playing a vastly different role in, uh, in making sure that we can manage this different uh, energy mix and landscape. And that's quite relevant because our landscape in Europe is hyper-connected. So if you see these are the electricity uh, lines and uh, you can see the, the, the synchronization zones uh, um, in, uh, in, in parts of Europe in the different colors. But we have a super and hyper connected grid on an international scale from a European perspective, but 
but um, uh, also a lot of impact on local scale. So locally also is, is connected as well. And we're now focusing a bit on electricity, but there are a lot of energy carriers out there um, that uh, play a role in the mix and making sure we can uh, meet uh, supply and, um, uh, and demand in Europe. Um, but I'll give some examples on how technology based on this changing energy landscape has to play a role. So with increased use of electricity and people um, uh, uh, and different area energy carriers, we uh, need um, technology to help us plan how we're going to change the grid. And this is a picture of part of the Netherlands. And um, usually when we uh, expand our grid, and make sure that we uh, uh, that we build new substations, so where the high voltage lines are converted into mid voltage lines, so they go into neighborhoods and so on in the ground for in in parts of the Netherlands. Um, we used to do this all by hand and with people making a lots of uh, asset management plans on this uh, location needs to be here so we can meet the supply and demand here. But nowadays we're asking algorithms to help us with this process. We're asking algorithms, okay, so um, if uh, this uh, is changing here, we get a heat network in this city. Um, this is changing in the energy mix for this part of the city. Where should the new substation be? And this is very interesting. Because we're asking AI, we're asking algorithms where we should build our substations. And now the fundamental question we already have in uh, parts of Europe is, okay, so how is bias introduced into these decisions? Um, and to give you a very practical example, if uh, we need to decide where we should lay thicker cables or uh, to, to provide more electricity, if you ask an AI based on all the data from the Netherlands and different neighborhoods, they will say, please do that in the richest areas of the Netherlands, because the chance of them buying solar panels, the chance of them buying electric cars is just the highest. So we should lay thicker cables in the richer neighborhoods so we can provide them with electricity and, and access to the grid more easily so they don't run into capacity issues. And that's fundamentally uh, um, uh, interesting to, from, a, from, from a technology perspective that an AI says that, but now the question uh, comes to shove. Um, if we're doing it this way, we're only increasing capacity in the richer neighborhoods and definitely not in the uh, neighborhoods with uh, with less money to spend on EVs and solar panels. And you get uh, um, um, uh, less access to the grid for those other areas. So, and that is what AI is introducing and actually what we're already running into. Um, so, so trying to uh, trying to remove that bias, trying to look at fairness from a from a, a grid perspective point of view, has become very very important. And this is just one example where we're trying to see where should the next electricity stations be. Um, but there's going to be AI all across the board, and from data collection to forecasting to active congestion management. So one of the things in Europe which is uh, um, uh, really coming up now is the fact that we have laid cables into the ground or uh, on the poles above the ground for uh, decades. And of course, as I mentioned before, we haven't predicted the use of those cables in a two-way uh, street, but only in a one-way generation to the consumers instead of consumers all uh, using their solar panels, which is really in a huge uptake in the U AU and pushing it back. And that means that the cables are used heavily and we need to manage them so we don't go over the capacity and we have uh, uh, faulted cables and uh, uh, disruptions. So we need AI across the board uh, to uh, address this uh, situation. But that, uh, again, with the example from here before, that means there could be bias in all of the steps of how we manage uh, uh, electricity, the energy mix in the Netherlands. So uh, that requires a lot of attention and a lot of collaboration. So what you see in the European energy landscape is that uh, over the past decades, everyone was, uh, every uh, uh, energy company, grid company was very much focused on their own uh, operations. But nowadays they have to open up what they're doing to learn from each other, to share how they can actively uh, use algorithms, but also actively fight this bias. And a great uh, example, you can see the products here already, and that's my last slide, is, is that people are using open source more and more, even for core grid capabilities, which was unthinkable 
um, uh, 20 uh, years ago, because that was all very proprietary. You have to protect this. But if we all are in this path and managing this complex world, this complex energy mix, we need all different kinds of, and these are all open source products with all uh, uh, grid forecasting capabilities and so on in the Linux Energy Foundation, but there are more open source uh, foundations there. But you see this opening up and that is something we couldn't have predicted 20 years ago and is definitely going on to further uh, technology use and also learn from each other on how we battle this bias in algorithms but we need to use them anyways to uh, manage the grid effectively that's my talk so far thank you thank you tim uh, also perfectly on time so thank you for being concise on that um is there anyone who has a particular question you can stand up to the mic and um, and ask your question and please introduce yourself thank you um my name is uh, mushtaba rezaka actually yeah, it works. Works. Yeah. Actually, I am MP from um, Iran's parliament. Um, you know, it's uh, interesting subject that you are dis discussing here. But you know, you can uh, look at it from different views. First of all, are we going to uh, distribute uh, the? I mean, are, are we going to consider the fairness of uh, energy distribution or? We are going to consider fairness in all subjects. Are we going to talk about just one subject or one subject? Let's ask it in another way. Um, are we going to use the same technology in all over the world or not? Um, you are talking about the fairness of energy distribution. So if uh, different parts of the world are using different technologies, how do you uh, come up with a solution for, for this subject. You know, let's say we are uh, using a car, some places are using gas, some places are using electricity. Even when you use gas, you know, there are different technologies that use, uh, you know, different amount of uh, fuel for the car. So if you are using different technologies, and probably it has, um, you know, other effects, are we going to consider those uh, items or not? Let's say, are we going to uh, consider uh, sameness of technology or not? Are we going to consider the impact of other, uh, you know, things? Let's say the environment, you know, you use when you use different technologies, but perhaps it, it impacts on the environment as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've heard a lot of questions. I, uh, Tim, did you catch them uh, sufficiently? Mostly. Okay. Mostly, and, and maybe we can use some of them for the further discussion yes, at the end. Yes. So that we, but but to, to give a short response and um, uh, the subject on fairness, just on one side of distribution, of course, makes no sense. Eh? So it's fairness across the board. But also, if you see everyone's using different technologies, not only um, uh, in different parts of the world, but even within countries, even within companies at some points, we use different technologies. So, uh, so the, the question begs us, can we look at everything from a modular point of view and where everything, every part is trying to assess fairness in their own way, but also look at the system as a whole? And this is the challenge yeah, for this in integral uh, approach. Um, but the, the question uh, still remains, we need to look at fairness across the board. So not only from an energy di distribution perspective, but also if we want to cut CO2 emissions in the Netherlands and in Europe and, as, uh, and globally, that also needs to, uh, also needs to work together. Um, and every country have different um, uh, challenges and different energy mix. Uh, for the Netherlands, we use a lot of natural gas because we had the natural gas bubble uh, uh, um, uh, in, our, in our own country, which we could use. So that, that that gives a whole different perspective on how and what changes we make in terms of CO2 and emissions than the country next to us. Uh, but as long as we're at, as transparent as possible within our technology and be able to make it as modular as possible that we can interact with the, the rest, well, that's that's the name of the game, but also there's no definite solution. So that's why we need to collaborate and work in an open way together to get there uh, step by step. Thank you, Tim. Um, well, then I'm gonna go next to me, Peace. Uh, Peach, sorry. Um, well, up to you, the floor is yours. Do you want the mic? Yes. Uh, hello everyone, so I'm Saik and 
online. We, um, I'm sorry, I, I'm feeling a bit under the weather, so if you hear a little bit of voice problem, I'm very sorry in advance. So, my name is Chantara Pete Oud. I'm uh, one of the organizing committee from Cambodia Internet Youth, uh, Youth Internet Governance Forums, which was hosted and held last month. And I'm also currently pursuing a green job. Uh, as a space and sustainable operation officer under Impact Hub Phnom Penh, and I hope to still pursue green job in the future as well. And today I'll be talking about how we can unlock Asian green energy future through youth. So, uh, why is green energy is, is important? So, according to the IPCC report that I went through, it highlights that the increasing global CO2 emissions is at a present predestined levels in which it leads us to need, it needs to be, uh, energy tra transition need to be fastened as nine out of our 10 Asian country currently have set net zero target, but still many of them are one of the most vulnerable to climate change in which among these nations, 650 million people reside in it. So the need for energy transition is very needed to supply the high rise in energy demands in which we face a lot of challenges while doing that for green energy transitions in Asian context because as you know each country has different infrastructures and each nation has their own respective uh, energy structure and system and also resources to supply those energy so transitioning might require a huge amount of financing, especially to the developing country. So they might need a lot of funds or support in technology transfer or knowledge uh, improvements from the neighboring country or the developing country in the region or outside the region as well. And also, while changes might be needed, changes will always affect things. So it might affect the existing jobs, if, uh, the existing economic opportunity as well, which need time to adapt. So which is why it might take a lot of time to do so. But I'll raise a few cases on how youths can contribute to this development. Uh, I will focus on youths instead. So first of all, green energy. So. As you see on the slide, these are some technology that are currently being invented by uh, youths. It could include green energy engineering, smart agriculture, renewable energy optimizations, air quality mon monitoring, which is green buildings, uh, climate modeling, eco-friendly transportation. These are all the technology that are currently being developed or in a very like early state. So, yes. These are uh, the youth-led technology that needed support to be turned into reality and in, uh, for their innovation and creativeness to blossom. So when you support them, you create entrepreneurship mindsets in our society in order to push our youth forward in even further. So investment in youth and their potential to our society is very crucial at this point. And moreover, they can also contribute by pursuing green jobs um, they can advocate for green tax or start recycling their e-waste or the previous generation waste. Yeah, and some of them might become a green AI researcher or sustainability data analyst, renewable energy engineer, clean tech researcher. So these are all the type of green job that youths can pursue in the future and need everyone's support in raising awareness on these green jobs. So when you increase the value of green job, more youths will start to realize that um, job that they are pursuing are actually making impact to their society and it can either be positive or negative and some people might just work to make admits but some people ca are working to actually make an impact. So I want to start making or raising awareness for you to realize that they can also make an impact while also earning money to uh, sustain their life. Yeah, and uh, in also uh, after green job, we also need to start raising awareness for them to pursue green job because uh, in for them to do that. They also need a lot of exposure for in my contact in Cambodia, I major in international relations and economic science. I was not aware of green jobs at all until I started working at Impact Hub, which I applied for the role without knowing it 
is a green job. So this is how clueless I am in terms of a youth. So that's, this is my youth perspective. This, this is why I want us all here to start emphasizing the importance of green jobs. So now let's move to the next one, which is Youth Green Internet Initiative. So aside from green job, we can also start making platform or events that raise those kind of awareness. For instance, I am part of Cambodian Youth Internet Governance Forums. This is the local internet governance forum, which are hosted around the world and it is the the internet government forum was held for the first time in cambodia which is very surprising when other country has had it for like uh, uh, so long so this is show how slow we are in terms of technology and ai transitioning so yes we need a lot of more even like this in the regions especially in also in cambodia and in other states yeah and moreover if for youths to actually voice out their opinions and voice out their concern, they can actually uh, go to the local conference of youth, which is Alcoy uh, held around uh, in each nation. Uh, and it is held under Yango, the official children and youth consist uh, constituency, which is under the United Nations frameworks of uh, Convention on Climate Change. And when you get the in the in one state to actually come up with a statement. Those statements are then forward to the Conference of Youth, which is the regional one. And once it's concluded in the Conference of Youth, it will also become part of Conference of Party, COP28, which is going to be held on 30 November until 12 December this year. So yeah, um, this is a platform in which uh, youths can actually learn and also become aware of the internet security while also raising about sustainability and the environment. And for this case, Alcoy is also being held for the first time in Cambodia as well, seeing this is very slow for us. Everything is the first time. So yeah, I will try my best to raise awareness on this. And I'll try to raise about AI, cybersecurity. So since youths need a lot of knowledge on it because they are the one who currently use a lot of internet and I believe harnessing a defen defense line on cyber security uh, is one of the most important thing for them and by making them become part of this conference will allow them to uh, the opportunity to be part of the decision making process as well and it's a space for them to voice their perspective, concern and idea related to digital policy on online rights and while advocating for climate change. So yes, I'll share you what uh, our neighbor country uh, actually, they already held the Alcoy this year, and this is their statement from the events. They want to call for Vietnamese youth to send relevant party to the COP28 conference. So I actually applied for this as well, and I hope I get selected to be part of it, to share about AI as well. Yes, and from Cambodia YIGF, we also got youth testimonial, in which I learned that Local IGF is very important as it's equipped you with knowledge on internet governance and its impact in the world that we're living in. So I sincerely hope that I raise the important views through my presentation and I hope you will be more involved and interested. Um, yes, I hope that sustainability field will be more acknowledged and fastened and we could fasten the inclusive energy transition in the future. Yes, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anyone who has a particular question for Peach? No? Okay. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, besides all your um, uh, the initiatives that you have uh, mentioned, even though those are all youth initiatives, there is a very good international initiative as well um, that is well, for youth and a bit older people. Um, uh, and that's called the Coalition for Digital Environmental Sustainability. Um, and um, uh, that's, oh, I see someone standing up for a question. I actually don't have a, s a question for Pete specifically, but probably the question for every speaker. <laughs> so actually my name is Wan Kwon. I'm from the Soviet development uh, industry and I believe in clean code. I believe that clean code will consume less energy than the bad codes. And I believe that when AI comes, 
it will generate it will consume a lot of energy so do you guys think about that uh, talk about that in the like policy making pro process as well because ai can help us achieve in the in the other areas but it also provide challenges as well so i hope you get my question thank you i i kind of kind of almost feel that this is a value in in coding but i i might be uh, might be wrong on this but if 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 you would allow me to uh, to only ask Hanna at the moment, so we can then move on to uh, to the, the the second part of the presentation of Hanna. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, that's definitely a, a value we already discussed today: incorporating sustainability in the design of uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, within the Coalition for Sustainable Digitization, we also have a working group that's looking at uh, principles for green software. Um, but I'm pretty sure that our expert on artificial intelligence, uh, Neil, uh, will get back on that in a second during our panel discussion. So uh, I suggest uh, we move on to that one. Yeah, that's why I also gave the, w the floor to you because the next part is also up to you, uh, Hannah. <laughs> All right, so um, I think we, uh, we gathered some, uh, some values, there they are. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, Tim and Peach and Neil to, uh, to have a look uh, at those values. Um, I think we leave them on the screen, right? Yeah. All right, so then uh, I'm going to turn uh, to Tim first. Um, so I see some, uh, some values, sustainability, fairness, energy, justice, trustworthiness. Uh, from the European uh, perspective, Tim, uh, which values do you consider most relevant and what is currently being done or can be done uh, to sustain these values in the energy transition from the European uh, perspective? Yeah, I, I think, and I will address the, the, the question of clean code we can get to later, uh, but if you look at the center, I think we, we see a few of them that are definitely very prevalent from a European perspective already, or at least from my perspective, for sustainability and fairness, and maybe integrity is one of the, the, the values uh, uh, which I'd, uh, I'd also want to see, yeah? because also access to energy is a um uh is a is a right is something we need to protect is is something we need to uh to make sure that everyone has that access so in integrity as a system as a whole i don't care if you're a grid operator or energy producer or a prosumer in the in the in the entire uh, in the world but integrity of the of the entire system is something we need to protect in order to um foster sustainability and 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 uh and, and to protect the fairness uh of the of the system so that is something that that i would want to add to the to, to the core of the the values all right thank you so much um beach then i'd like to turn to you and uh, so uh, looking at these uh, values which one uh do you consider uh, most relevant from uh, from the Asian perspective, and how are you currently uh, sustaining those values uh, from your perspective? Um, for me, in the context of Asia green energy transition, I believe that um, renewable harnessing renewable energy more efficiently and storing it more effectively would be uh, the value that I think Asians should focus on as. Currently, we are using fossil fuel, and most of the region are like related in terms of sharing those energy. And as uh, everyone may know, currently there's a little bit turbulence uh, with uh, Ukraine and Russia, so that's also tip off the energy sharing between our region as well. So I think uh, Asians should focus more on renewable energy in order for them to supply and sustain their energy in the future as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, then final panel question uh, to Neil. And uh, Neil, after answering uh, this question, I would also uh, would like to ask you to, uh, to go uh, into the question about um, energy efficient uh, coding uh, within AI. But um, 
first to the panel question. So, um, yeah, we heard the replies of Tim and Peach uh, with regards to uh, relevant values and how to sustain them uh, from both our perspectives. So, um, from the perspective on uh, how AI can help to realize an inclusive energy transition, um, how do you think that both perspectives could straighten each other to sustain the named values? Yeah, I think it's, it's an important question. So, uh, there's, I guess there's, there's root, one root of technology is that the values are more of the kind of the capitalism or the more the marketplace. So we want to deliver some value to some people. And so, you know, we develop technology to do this. And then we want to, you know, to sell this and so on. Um, a second way of perhaps designing technology is what's called value sensitive design which is we think about what are the values of you know, the potential customers, but more broadly of society, and how do we incorporate those values in the design process? So value sensitive design. Um, and I think this can be one way to sustain values which certain stakeholders society might think are important. Um, and, and linked with this, I think there's also the notion of that there's some sensitivity to how values can change. So particularly in longer term decisions. So for example, Tim mentioned infrastructure decisions. You know, if we're making decisions now, which will have be with us for you know, 20, 30, 40 years, then not only what are today's values, but also potentially what are, how much those values evolve in the future. Okay. So this is this is a you know, hard question. This is you know, it's not my speciality. Um, but I think it's it's to recognize that some of the decisions we make now have future consequences, and at least to be aware of that. Then turning to the second question, particularly of the values of efficiency. So if I understood what the, 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 the asker, uh, the question was about, it's when we have code, we have algorithms, we have AI systems, having more efficient systems, so better designed code, cleaner code, um, how can that contribute also to, to questions about sustainability? Um, and I, I agree that is a value. In fact, just yesterday, I was talking with some people about you know, you're doing a your tech startup. You're bringing this new AI technology. Um, what are the values? Is it indeed, you know, time to market, disruption, and um, potential profit, and so on, or is some of the values maybe we go slower when we're developing our systems, we're implementing our code, because we take on this non-functional requirement of the efficiency of, of the, let's say, the AI algorithm. Um, and to me, this is interesting because I don't know to what extent people think about this so i don't know you know you download an app onto your phone and the app is you know 500 megabytes but actually maybe it could only be 100 megabytes if you if the you know developers took more time and you know focused on the size and the and the efficiency of things um, so i think it's an important question to raise and, and maybe to add i also think that the um, the, the the work Peach is doing, uh, the awareness part of of of, of looking at uh, how you impact on a societal level. If you, uh, I think that's that's definitely a part still um, not always uh, taken into account into developing algorithms across the world. Uh, I can see that already in my company. If we build something, we want to build it to 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 have functional impact, and then we also have to ask ourselves: uh, Is the code clean enough? Does how does it run efficiently? And to look at that from a broad perspective, whatever you're doing, so every job can be a clean job. Uh, to, to 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 put it in uh, in the, the, the phrases you used earlier, um, I think there. So there's work in awareness. I saw awareness on the screen as well. Is is still something we need to work on uh, in in the broader sense of the word, and not only people working in energy, but working in any sector who's building any kind of application because you're impacting the the energy transition in one way or another, anyways. So uh, so awareness is probably a big thing there. Yes, it's still on. Um, yes, thank you, Tim and uh, Neil, for your contributions on on, on answering those questions. Um, I'm I am really pleased with the amount of people who have like handed in a few words. Uh, I, I I just want to recognize that first of all. Is there anyone else who who has a particular question on uh, on the presentations given? No. Do you have have anything more to add on on uh, on the on the, the the word cloud? 
Uh, I think it's very valuable input since we're here today with an international audience and I'm really pleased uh, to see your input on values on, uh, on a very important topic that is of uh, international importance. Uh, so I just want to emphasize that, uh, that, yeah, that kind of input is, uh, is something we need and uh, international cooperation on these kind of topics is very important. So thank you so much for your input. Yes, well, if there are, aren't any other questions anymore, um, I would like to ask um, uh, um, Tim if he had, uh, well, maybe let's say it like this, um, if any of the, the speakers want to have any closing remarks, um, I would want to give them one minute each um, for key takeaways. Okay, uh, so one minute, okay, I'll try and make the most of it. So yeah, I just hope that everyone here got to learn a lot from uh, the, uh, got a lot from the sessions and I just hope that I make an impact as a youth and I'm just here on behalf of my team and I sincerely hope to see a more inclusive energy transition in the future and in order to do that, not only youth will be the important stakeholder, but also the adults and the people who are on the high up as well that need to help in uh, giving us direction and shaping it for us to actually follow and also to help them and support them in the future. And I sincerely hope that everyone would give us op more opportunity to take part in this kind of event in order to learn and also to improve our knowledge on this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Peach. Um, um, Tim, your final remarks. Yeah, so as I mentioned in my story, I, I see your um, a tremendous force to opening up everything we're doing uh, from a technology perspective, but also from a complexity perspective. And that's not a bad thing. That's, that means that we can all more easily contribute to uh, what we're doing here, whether it's open source, whether it's sharing values uh, um, uh, in, in different areas to, to foster the energy transition. So seeing all that open up and seeing what we're already, where technology is also forcing us, I think is a, is a, is a big opportunity for everyone to, uh, to, uh, to make sure that we're on the right value track and do value-based design, as Neil said. And uh, so I, I, I'm hopeful for the future where we are uh, managing this landscape, not only in Europe, but in the entire world and sharing that knowledge. So that's my, uh, my last two cents. Thanks, Tim. Neil, last but not least. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I think a, a value that's also um, in the discussion is the notion of accountability. So accountability of AI systems, um, accountability of those who develop them, accountability more generally in society towards the energy transition. And perhaps to add also, as Tim said, there's, um, I mean, there is a global perspective on this. Um, and so are also European countries accountable to, to other parts of the world um, as we are, we're inter interdependent. Um, and I hope we have things to learn from each other but also to strive together towards the energy transition. Thank you, Neil. Um, I would um, then want to thank all the speakers, all the, the tech team here for, uh, for ensuring that this session went really, really smooth. Um, and I in particular want to thank the speakers for, or some of them, for waking up really early in the, in the morning um, because they are in a, in a quite different time zone. Um, and um, I went to, uh, yesterday in the main hall, I, um, I asked um, um, uh, the panel th uh, there on the GDC um, if they could uh, ensure that there would be um, a bit more about sustainability in the GDC because it was, uh, it was very, very little what's been mentioned in, in the policy brief of the, of the Secretary General, no, sorry, from the Tech Envoy. Um, and in that main hall, that's where the Kyoto Protocol was signed um, or the final negotiations took place. And I think it's we're in this incredible building here um, and we should think about the, the future in that sense. And I think it's, um, it's wonderful that we're having more and more discussions about sustainability and digitalization and, and making that combination. And I think we had a great session here on accelerating an inclusive energy transition. 
Um, so with these final notes, I, I want to thank you all for attending this session. And please feel free to, to chatter around and, and exchange on information, um, because I think that's where the most interesting discussions come from. Thanks.